Hi, I'm Roger. I'm an assistant professor at UFT. I work on machine learning and deep learning in particular. Hi, I'm Kyung Hyun Jo. I'm an assistant professor of the computer science and data science at New York University. I work on machine learning and in particular its application to the natural language and machine translation. Yeah, so to start off, um, can you say a bit about how you got started? So, um, first got interested in machine learning and then moved a bit into language. Right, so how I got into the natural language processing machine translation was in some sense very unorthodox. So I worked on the machine learning and then in particular neural networks for the generative modeling during my PhD years. And then I decided to move to Montreal to become a postdoc fellow with the Yosho Benjo. Then when I arrived there, Yosho Benjo <coughs> came to my desk, asked me, okay, what do you want to work on? And I said, you know, do you have any idea about you know, what I should work on? And Yosho told me there are four options, four topics that he has been thinking about. Now I don't actually remember the fourth one. So the first one was just do whatever you have been doing so far and just continue on that. Like to work on the both machines, work on the denoising model. Second one was slight variant of that. Work on the generative stochastic networks that Joshua initially think, and I'm not sure if he still thinks it that way, was the next greatest idea in deep learning. And I think you know, it is a great idea, but maybe not the greatest idea. And then the third thing was machine translation. And obviously I asked that. So Joshua, you know, like, I don't know machine translation. I don't think you know machine translation. I don't think anybody at this level knows about machine translation. And you know, Yoshua said yes. I was like, okay, that sounds interesting. And then that's how I actually started to work on machine translation by reading the machine translation textbook from there on and trying to look at the recurrent neural nets. And then you know, like the, immediately after about a month or so of reading the textbooks and the papers and then trying to you know like implement the recurrent neural nets and so on, I realized that it's a very fun you know, topic to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so at the time. Um, most people working in neural nets were using very generic models. Um, what made you decide to consider attention? Right. So, you know, like in some sense, there is always a question of you know, like the, what I do is is it a algorithmic research or the application research? I always ask myself, and a lot of other people also <coughs> ask me. And then you know, like what I think is that the, many of the scientific advances or algorithmic advances are in fact inspired and motivated from the actual problem. So, how attention was motivated? was the fact that we were really struggling with the scaling of the generic recurrent neural net to do the translation as well as the existing systems. So it was doing a decent translation, I have to say. And then you know, the Google people, like Daniel Suskever and others, were able to show that if we really, really scale up, we can actually do really good translation. However, there was always a limit somehow. And then we were really struggling in summer 2014, I still remember, like Yosho Benjo was sending every single intern he was getting to me so that you know, like we can somehow crack this. And then we had this uh, brilliant back then master's student's intern, Tim Abad now, who is now finishing his PhD study in the University of Montreal. He was one of them. And we were essentially spending every day all together trying to figure out how to solve this problem. And then eventually one thing we noticed was that okay, there has to be a better way to handle an input that has a different complexities. So the you know, longer input, shorter input, sometimes shorter input has a much more diverse set of words in it and so on. So we need somehow to dynamically adjust the, you know, the network itself. And then you know, like during the discussion, Dima came up with this brilliant idea. And then this was one of those ideas where as soon as Dima described it, because we've been thinking about this problem so much, we could like immediately see that okay, this is it, we gotta do this. This is the one that's contextual. And it actually turned out to work in about a week. We actually tried it out immediately. So that was that, that's how we got to this. So it was purely from the actual application that this approach came uh, came out of this. Mm -hmm. So in doing all this uh, work on NLP and machine learning, has it taught you anything interesting about language? Ah, so this is a Trick question. I have to be careful because you know, like the, depending on how I answer this, you know, like the, some people might not love me anymore. Kind of question, right? <laughs> so, yeah, one thing I have noticed is that the surprisingly a lot of techniques that I was familiar with and I'm familiar with that were let's say widely or more widely used in the computer vision or in many other fields are in fact very much directly applicable to natural language. And then you know, like the, 
at that point, you know, like the people start to, or the I start to ask me, like, well, what are the actual difference between the natural language and then any other form of the perception? And then one thing we notice is that the natural language is weird in a sense that it has both a very low level as well as high level abstraction mixed in a single, let's say, sentence or a single instance. So in a single sentence, we might have the words that refers directly to the actual objects in the world. And then, then actually that becomes very much similar to computer vision. So Alona Fish, who is now in the University of Alberta, she actually recently showed that the, the vector representation you get for those concrete words, and then the vector representation you get from the convolutional neural net based on the images of those con concrete words, in fact, they converge to a similar value. Or you know, when you look at the trend, look at the distribution, they look very, they look very similar. Although they were trained completely separately. <clears throat> now, I think that what it means is that they, that is probably the reason why all these techniques that we have developed for the vision as well as audio are applied to the natural language. But it seems like there will be, we are running into and we will run into the issues of some kind of role eventually because we are actually not entirely sure about how to handle those abstract notions. So even in the computer vision, detecting objects much easier than trying to detect the intention behind the objects or the multiple objects in the image. And the natural language, that's just almost always there. It just has to be tackled, and then we'll see how we are going to tackle it, and then whether we can use a very same technique again in the future. Interesting. So one question that a lot of us in the field are thinking about is, are we really making conceptual progress on neural nets? I mean, we hear a lot about you know, building bigger networks, training on larger data sets, and so on. I mean, are we making conceptual progress, or is it all about people training that bigger network? Right, so that's, a, <laughs> that's also a tricky question, all right? <laughs> so, you know, first, first thing first, what I believe is that the, I believe our neural nets are still way too small. I, I do believe that we have to build a bigger network. So not bigger as in okay, increasing both the computation as well as the memory, you know, like indefinitely, but in terms of let's say trying to increase the capacity. So maybe you know we can increase the capacity without increasing the number of parameters, or maybe we can increase the capacity by increasing the number of parameters, but not increasing the computation. So there must be some way that I believe that the, the neural net capacities are generally too low at the moment. So I think we want to always push it further. But at the same time, that does not mean that the how we are training these models at the moment is the best we can do. So, you know, like if from my talk, I tried to touch up on different ways to train the very same neural net in a different ways uh, to, for the different objectives or the different let's say, purposes. You know, what the this availability of this diverse set of the learning as well as inference algorithms or the principles that can be applied to a single model, I believe implies that the we are we probably haven't explored this space enough. And the meaning that there may be other type of the learning principles or the inference principles that can actually use better the existing models. So even if we increase the size of the model and the capacity, which I think is unnecessary, eventually we want both the capacity, let's say, increase as well as the better learning principles to show up so that we can actually maximally use whatever the resources. And then in that sense, are we making actual progress? So I guess it's about the, more of the latter part. I, I believe we are, we are making progress. Just that you know, scientific progress is never forward only. Mm -hmm. It's more of the random walk, just that when you look back, on average, we've been making a bit of a progress. So I think we are making progress. That's true, you can't always recognize it when it happens. Yes, precisely. Only when we look back, we'll see it. All right, well, thank you very much. All right, thank you.